Welcome, everybody. I hope you had a good Easter break. Our speaker today at the Art of Fridays is Professor Matteo Lucchini. He is a senior assistant professor at the physics department of Politecnico di Milano. He studied engineering physics at the Politecnico di Milano, where he graduated in December 2008 and obtained a PhD in physics cum laude at the same institute in March 2012 with a thesis on the development of new techniques for the generation of single attosecond pulses and the application to molecular dynamics. And in the same year, he joined the ultra-fast later physics group, Eidgenossische Technische Hochschule, ETH, uh, led by Professor Ursula Keller, where he was awarded an ETH Zurich postdoctoral fellowship Marie Curico founded, and he devoted his efforts to transfer attosecond techniques in solid targets for the study of electrodynamics. And in particular, he worked on photoelectrodynamics photo from noble metals like copper, silver, and gold. And he studied the phenomena like screening, effective mass with substrate per second resolution. He also performed attosecond transient absorption spectroscopy to study strong field physics in dielectrics like diamond and gallium arsenide. And in 2017, he became junior assistant professor at Politecnico di Milano. And in 2019, he has been awarded the prize Alfredo Di Braccio for young Italian physicists and the Fresno Prize by the European Physical Society for outstanding contributions in the field of second science. And in 2021, he has been awarded the prize Antonio Feltrinelli Giovanni for a researcher uh, in physics under the age of 40. At present, Matteo is in charge of the scientific activity performed at the other second laboratories at the Politecnico di Milano, where he is a PI of the ERC SEG project Audace, which aims at studying the first instance of light matter interaction with other second pulses in advanced materials. And today, um, he will talk about attosecond transient reflectivity spectroscopy for the study of exciton dynamics in solids. So we're gonna have a solid talk. We're looking forward to it. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation. And Matteo, we are ready to go if you are. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, for the invitation and the opportunity. I start by sharing the screen. So I don't have really to repeat the title here today. The point is to talk about um, accident dynamics and now we can we can use all optical techniques in the second science to study them. Why exactly accident dynamics? Exciton are uh, for all all electron quasi particles uh, which form in semiconductors and insulator and actually um, determine the electro-optical properties of most of them. So to study their dynamical response is important for condensed uh, phase physics, but also to material science and photonic technologies. Despite their importance, little is known about the ultrafast dynamics which happen during light matter interaction with these quasi-particles and when these quasi-particles are created. Um, and in particular, what we know from time-resolved studies in the picosecond domain, few hundreds of femtosecond domain, is that we expect two different kinds of, two classes of effects solid-like effects and atomic-like effects. And with these, I mean effects like dynamical friend Schelbisch effects, so a, a effect which is related to a charge, virtual charge motion inside the, the material, which is typically responsible for a shift of the absorption edge around the energy gap or any optical gap within the material, uh, which depends uh, on, the, on the field, uh, which, which is used to drive material, its intensity, the frequency, and so forth. Uh, while for atomic-like effects, I, I, I mean effects like the Stark effect, which is an effect uh, that can be found also in atoms. Whenever you have two, a two-level system and an external field scuffing the two systems, changing uh, the energy spacing between them. So if you have an absorption, signature you might see when you uh, shine a light onto a sample that you're able to change to induce an energy shift of this absorption feature. So, okay, how can we disentangle these two effects which are thought to compete on ultra-fast time scales? Uh, well, since it's not been possible to do it on a picosecond uh, range or 200 petasecond range, then the idea is to go 
to short time scales and go into the up to second domain. And this now brings me to the outline of my talk. I would like to explain you briefly the experimental technique and material we decided to, to use to investigate this problem, then show you the setup and the, the experimental results, and finally, uh, the interpretation and conclusions. So how can we study them? Uh, excitons can be studied with different techniques. And nowadays, there are very nice experiments of photoemission, angular resolved photoemission in 2D materials showing the formation of excitons in decay bellies uh, of uh, TDMCs. Um, but we decided rather to go, instead of going towards photoemission, which is definitely demanding uh, on the other second domain uh, standard sources and uh, one kilohertz repetition rate, uh, we decided instead to use all optical techniques. And this is something that, that is well known and used in the, in the synchrotron since uh, many years. Uh, if you uh, go and look at the absorption edge of a certain material, and you can study the features of the absorption properties, absorption or reflectivity properties. And uh, with this technique already from the static profile of the absorption, you can learn a lot about what is going on in the material in the specific target. And uh, with XUV light, which can be typically generated with the second sources, we can access different edges in different materials, which are element specific. Uh, in particular, it's rather easy to, uh, to go and investigate L edges or M edges in transition metals, for example. Um, and this can be done either by looking at the absorption, so the transmission of the material, or the reflectivity of the material. And the idea is to, to measure these kind of profiles while adding uh, an external field, a pump field, in a pump probe scheme so that you, you measure the properties, the optical properties of the material uh, with the pump probe delay. And at the second resolution, of course. So if we look already into literature, this means uh, that you either use an second transit absorption spectroscopy scheme where you look at the transmitted spectrum of the, of the attosecond radiation. And to study uh, exciton dynamics on ultra short time scale, this has already been used uh, already back in 2017 by Monet and workers to study core exciton formation in silicon dioxide or transient reflectivity spectroscopy. So you monitor the reflected radiation onto the material. Uh, which has been more recently used by uh, Gino and co-workers uh, to, to study uh, the ultra-fast dynamics of exit um, transitions in magnesium oxide. In both cases, uh, the authors observed very fast dynamics that I will show you later, we also saw in magnesium chloride. Um, that can be explained uh, mainly by the optical circuit. So uh, what we wanted to, to see is if it's possible to, to observe other dynamics, maybe faster than these few femtosecond dynamics, and see if there is something more going on, there, some, some other strong field effect. And we decided to go with transient reflectivity spectroscopy. Why? Both these techniques have pros and cons. Uh, so they are all optical techniques. Absorption is most sensitive to, uh, it's bulk sensitive, to, so to the wall, uh, to, to the wall sample, which means that if you have uh, a non-perfect surface to a certain degree or a very thin layer of oxide, this might not be so important. While transient reflectivity is mostly sensitive to the first layers, um, which means that you need a higher quality uh, of the surface. The interpretation of absorption is easier. Uh, why it, it's more difficult with uh, reflectivity, but most importantly, um, with a second transient reflectivity spectroscopy, you can take very thick samples. And this means that you can handle better heat dissipation, you can have better quality samples, which is not possible, really possible in absorption, because due to the relative low flux of the XUV radiation and the high absorption coefficient of materials in this, in this uh, energy range of the photons, if you have a too broad or not freestanding uh, sample, then you can actually have basically no photons transmitted, which means that the signal to noise of your measurement drops dramatically uh, to the point where it's even not possible to measure in a certain energy range. Uh, 
Um, and also, due to the small thickness of the sample, it is not so easy to, uh, to handle heat dissipation, which means that you can actually destroy or melt your, your sample uh, before you reach the pump intensity you need to initiate a dynamic. For what concerning the interpretation, uh, absorption is easier though, um, because in, in, a, in an easy picture, if you have a lossy medium with a, a complex refractive index, Absorption is mainly related to the imaginary part of the refractive index, so the imaginary part of uh, the material, uh, the electric function. While reflectivity, well, what you look depends on both imaginary and, and real part of the refractive index and in a nonlinear fashion, which changes with the angle on which you impinge on the sample and also with the polarization uh, of, your, of your parts. Nevertheless, we found that the limitation on sample preparation sometimes are very strong. And uh, after we performed some first experiments in, in polycrystalline materials or in crystalline materials, it took us a very long time to prepare. We decided to give shot also to transit reflectivity spectroscopy to see whether it was possible actually to retrieve information, valuable information, um, having a way easier sample to prepare. And in this particular case, we decided uh, to, uh, to take magnesium fluoride. Why? Because it's an insulator, so it can withstand high, uh, high um, intensities. And uh, it's an ionic uh, solid, uh, so where the Mg core is weakly screened, and you can have formation of core level excellence around the magnesium L23 edge. We, and, and this has already been observed. Uh, to give a distinct peak, peak in the um, reflectivity of the material around 54 AB, more or less, already back in 1972. So it's known that we, we should see a clear uh, signature of exciton creation, core exciton creation around these energies. So now the, what is missing is just to have a setup which is able to observe this in the pump protection around this photon energy. And this is what we developed. Um, the first part is rather standard. So you have an uh, 800 nanometer uh, commercial laser, which is delivering roughly one millijoule pulses after compression, 10 kilohertz, less than six femtoseconds. These pulses, we start from 25 femtoseconds, more or less, two millijoules, a little bit less, then focus them into a uh, normal core fiber uh, to compress them uh, with a, a set of chirp mirrors, and we get to these pulses which then are sent into uh, evacuated beam line, of course. The pulses are divided into two by a beam splitter at the beginning of the interferometry, interferometry we have here. Um, and then the most intense part goes, uh, is reflected and goes into a gas cell, uh, which is filled with static gas, argon in this case, to generate the harmonics with the high order harmonic generation process. Then we have a set of filters, which are used to filter the remaining uh, IR radiation. And the other arm instead is, goes through a delay line. Uh, there is a chopper to be able to, to get a reference signal uh, from time to time. And then after folding and proper uh, divergent matches, they are actually both uh, put together on a drill mirror, make collinear, and focused onto a toroidal mirror. And what you see here, the red beam is actually a co-propagating helium neon laser, which is used to actively stabilize the interferometer. And we could measure uh, RMS of about 48 at a second within one hour. So with this active stabilization, we, we are able to control uh, the um, interferometer we use for the pump probe measurement. So as I said, both beams are focused by the toroidal mirror into a first interaction region where we have a time of flight spectrometer and a nozzle for the injection of gas targets, in this case, neon. So in this interaction region, we can perform more standard uh, photoelectron spectroscopy measurements, uh, which have been used since the beginning of the second science for the characterization of the pulses, for example. What is new in this case, so what we added to the beam line 
was this second toroidal mirror, which is able to refocus the radiation onto a sample order that can move in the three direction and can rotate, where we place our solid sample. And then we have a steering mirror to catch the reflected radiation and send it through an XV spectrometer, where we can actually collect the spectrum of the radiation. And with this sample order and steering mirror, we can change without the need for open everything, the, the angle uh, at which we are looking for reflectivity on the sample. And this brings me to the first, if you want, it's a technicality, a technicality, but it's a technical difficulty you have, uh, which is not there with absorption. So at what angle do we perform the measurement? Reflectivity depends on the polarization of your light and on the impinging angle. And if we look at the reflectivity, uh, we see this is now being calculated with the N, uh, the refraction coefficient published by Anson and co-worker. You, you see that it changes with the angle and the photon energy. Um, you see a sharp feature around the excitonic peak position. And you see that it's increasing with increasing angle from the normal. So one would think, okay, maybe better is to go as grazing incidence as you can, because then you maximize the signal. Um, well, sort of, and you have to take into account then that the projection of your beam onto the sample becomes quite big. So if the sample is not big enough, uh, then, or not homogeneous, then you are probing different regions. Uh, you have to take into account that the more grazing incidence you go, the longer it needs your, your setup to be. So you may have actually constrictions, geometrical constriction in your lab. Uh, and also, well, like that, you're, you're maximizing the, the reflectivity, but you're not really maximizing the interaction with the, with the solid, which is what you would like to. And one idea then is actually to go and look at the critical angle, which gives you total external reflection, which in the visible is called total internal reflection. And for the, uh, at the energy position of the exciton for kinesium fluoride is around 73.5. Uh, degrees. And this is a, a good place to be because at this angle you have total external reflection. So it means that you have locally, uh, close to the surface, amplification of the XUV field. And this improves your probing capabilities. Furthermore, often this angle corresponds to the angle at which the sensitivity to the imaginary part of the dielectric function uh, of your reflectivity signal is reduced, which means that if you, if you have in mind what I said before, the interpretation is not so easy in this case. Um, it means that you are helping a bit interpretation because it means that you are mostly sensitive to the real part of epsilon, so the imaginary part of the conductivity, uh, not, not completely insensitive to, uh, to what happens to the absolute value of epsilon 2, but uh, you reduce the sensitivity to their variations. Okay, so once we identify this angle, we can go back to, to the setup and measure the sample reflectivity. And here, if you are used to absorption, you encounter another, another problem. Uh, well, with absorption, again, technical problem, but one has to take into account. So with absorption, imagine you want to, to measure the absorption of the material. So what you have to do is place your sample into the beam path, measure the transmitted spectrum, remove your sample, and normally in absorption you go at normal incidence, so perpendicular to the wind direction, and measure the incoming, the incoming spectrum, and then you get directly the total absorption. If you know, well, you know the OD, uh, the optical density, if you know the length of the thickness of your sample, you get the absorption coefficient. Um, but with reflectivity, this cannot be done. I mean, what, what I can measure if I place the sample into the interaction region is the reflected spectrum of my radiation. In this case, I show you the reflection of a COM of harmonic, so not the second pulse strain. Uh, and now, if I want to get the reflectivity, I need to know the incoming flux. But if I remove the sample, then the beam goes straight and doesn't even reach the spectrometer. So I need some, somehow to place here another reflection so that I can bring back the, the, the spectrum, uh, the XV radiation into the spectrometer or to move the spectrometer. But this also gives potential errors uh, if you impinge the detector in a different position. So what we decided to do is actually the following. We decided to deposit a very thin layer, 50 nanometers of gold uh, onto the sample on one side. 
so that it could be regarded to be bulk and uh, move the sample in position so that we can measure the reflectivity of both. If then we know uh, the tabulated values for the gold reflectivity, and gold is a quite nicely studied material, so these values are known, we can retrieve then finally the reflectivity of our unknown target. And this is what I show you here, is the reflectivity between 40 and 60 V of our magnesium fluoride. So what, what are we observing here? Uh, well, in this region, uh, the XV photons can actually promote directly electrons from the 2p states of magnesium, the L to 3 edge, into the conduction band, or create excitons right below the conduction band around 54.5p. And this transition energy nicely corresponds to the peak that we observed in the reflectivity, which again uh, corresponds to what had been observed by Anson and Kowarkens in, in 1972. What we have here, uh, it's a, a measurement with better resolution. So we also see this shoulder, which is at the distance of 0.44 eV, um, which corresponds to the spinor splitting of the 2p magnesium 2p state. Fine, now we know we can actually measure a fingerprint of a bright exiting state and exiting formation. And the idea is to add the ion field, pump the system out of equilibrium and perform a pump probe experiment and look how this reflectivity changes with the delay between the XP and the IR. Uh, there is more actually to that uh, that we can do with this setup since we have two distinct FOCI. While we measure the reflectivity of the sample, we can also measure uh, the photoelectron spectra as a function of the delay in the first class target and get the so-called seeking trace from which with frog like reconstruction algorithm, we can get the temporal characteristics of the XV and the IR pulse. And this is nice because now that we have the profile of the IR pump, we can actually use this to calibrate what we will see in the transient reflectivity trace here, in which sense? In the sense that we, we can actually know the relative delay between the, the dynamical feature we will observe here in the XV spectrometer and the pump who, who actually initiate them. Uh, this is not new, it's been already used in transient absorption spectroscopy, um, but normally there is easier because since, since you need only a very thin and small sample placed uh, perpendicular to the beam, what people do normally, I also did it in the past, is to place this gas jet very close to the sample and measure simultaneously on the same site both electrons from a noble gas like neon and the absorption of the material. Well, uh, with reflectivity, if you want to be able to move this sample around and change the orientation and alignment, then you have a bulky uh, sample holder, which is not really compatible with uh, the open geometry you need for a time of flight spectrometer to be there. So, and, and also uh, you will have to place basically this in front of, of, the, of the material and, and, and flux uh, your sample with um, with gas, which maybe you cannot do because you will destroy the same. So what we decided to do is to separate the two, put it in the first focus. This is why we have a two forty geometry. Um, and this is nice because then we can perform them together without uh, the need for, for worrying about anything. Uh, but uh, this means that the two are spatially separated. And so the temporal properties we retrieve in the first focus might actually be different from the ones that you actually have in the second focus. And this is mainly because of the differences in, in, fo in focusing properties, we phase and so on. And also because of the additional reflectivity you have the toroid on mirror, which is gold plated. Um, so we this decided one can do uh, calculations to take this into account theoretically or uh, use a pragmatic approach. So what we decided to do is to use a simultaneous two rapid measurement to characterize how the pulses change from one focus to the other. And what we did is the following. So we, we take an second pulse strain composed by a combo of harmonics, ionize neon in the first gas target and get the photoelectron spectrum, which actually resembles uh, the XUV spectrum. If you add the IR field to the process and change the delay between them, then you get what is called rapid trace. I don't think I have to explain it to um, the community of the Alto Fridays, but 
in case there is someone else who just started and doesn't doesn't knew um, then what you see here is you you get your combo harmonics in the total spectrum and you have photoelectron spectra as a function of the delay between a r and x b so you see uh, lines horizontal lines corresponding to the harmonic ionization plus a signal in between which is called sideband that oscillates with twice the IR frequency. And this is because the signal comes from uh, the interference of two indistinguishable paths, which involve the absorption of two subsequent harmonic photons and emission or absorption of an additional IR photon. And therefore you have oscillation and oscillations with twice the IR frequency. It is possible to show, uh, for example, with second order perturbation theory that this signal, the signal of the sideband, should go as a cosine of two i's uh, IR frequency times the delay minus a phase. And this phase contains information on the XUB temporal properties, the IR temporal properties, and the properties of the sample that has been used, that has been ionized. And actually, this technique, as you, you know, uh, probably know, is used uh, very often and uh, in, in auto second metrology to study the properties of the material you are ionizing, uh, basically, for example, the, the, the local potential of the material during the photoionization process, if you know the properties of XV and IR. We want to do the opposite. We want to know how the temporal properties of XV and IR change from one focus to the other. So what we decided to do, go back to our setup, remove the solid sample, place there another, another top identical to the first one, and perform a simultaneous rapid trace in the first and the second focus. And this is what you get. Now, what we can do is integrate the sample signal on both traces, compare them directly, extracting the phases, because now if we look at the phase difference of the same side and order, then the atomic properties will uh, cancel. Of course, if you use the same, uh, the same species in the first and the second focus. And then what you get any non-zero difference of the phases is related to how the XV properties are changing between the first and the second focus, XV and IR properties. Uh, you get a phase difference. If you divide by the oscillating frequency, you get phase delay. And this is what we obtained uh, experimentally. So you see that overall between 35 and 50 EV, the delays we obtained between the first and the second focus are contained in 40 at a second. The mean is around 240 at a second, more or less. So for simplicity, we decided to take, this is all within the, uh, anyway, the resolution of our experiment and the uh, standard deviation of the data we collect, uh, which is limited by the, the noise of the flux. Therefore, we decided for simplicity to take only a single value, 240 at a second uh, in the whole range. And now that we have this, we can finally look into transient reflectivity data. So what we did was to measure simultaneously the um, field, the IR field, which is inducing the dynamics, and the reflectivity of the material. And what I show you here is the differential reflectivity. Remember, we have a shutter, so we can actually get the static reflectivity and look at the difference between pump and unpump reflectivity normalized by the unpump reflectivity. And now that we know also the time, uh, time relation between the first focus and the second focus, we can calibrate the same trace, the transient effectivity trace, uh, with respect to the same zero of the streaking trace. We observed, and now uh, we can say that we observed rich dynamics, uh, which evolved around the exciton position, which is here, where I mark A and A prime are the two, the main peak. Uh, of the excitonic transition and the shoulder due to the spin thing, and also within the conduction band. And in particular, we see that these dynamics evolve on two different time scales. If we filter the low, uh, the slow part, slow, which means few frames per second, actually, so it's rather fast, we see uh, that dynamics, the dynamics are mainly located around the exciton transitions. While if we look at the fast component, we obtain uh, an oscillating component, which, which follows the square of the IR electric field, and is located in the whole energy region, mainly in the conduction band, and also on, onto the uh, excitonic transition. 
So what is this? The, 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 this, this fast oscillating uh, signal actually was new, never observed before. And now the, the problem was how, how to understand this. We went back uh, to the theory, actually to our theoretical collaborators, Angel Rubio uh, from Hamburg and Shunshu Kesato from uh, Tsukuba University. And the whole group there, we performed calculation with a 1D Mod model, which includes basically what I show you here. So it has parabolic approximation for conduction band, balance band, uh, to, uh, to excitonic states, bright one and a dark one, and the magnesium 2P core levels. And if you, if you use this model, you can already reproduce quite nicely the static reflectivity here with the shoulder of the spinoid splitting and also the dynamical reflectivity we calculate. And now, well, uh, the full calculations also do not tell us that much, but, but now we can, with the calculation, play a bit, since there is very nice agreement between experiment and calculations, and try to see what happens if we switch off, for example, the excitonic contribution, which means removing these not dispersive atomic-like states which describe the accident, or, and we get then the, the crystal, the bare crystal response, or we remove the parabolic dispersive band and see what an atomic-like model will give us. And, and here you see the result. So it's basically the response of the, the exciton without interaction with the crystal. And it seems that this response nicely reproduces what we see in our data. It seems that qualitatively everything is there, the slow component and the fast oscillations it seems to match. Is it true? Because if this is true, since it comes from an atomic light model, it means, again, everything is dominated by the atomic nature of the axis. Uh, well, let's start, let, let's divide the two, the two fast and slow components and study them separately. Um, here is experiment and full model results. If we look at exciton and crystal contributions, we see that the exciton contribution matches quite nicely. We can, for example, take line outs of different delays in the experiment over opposed to or superimposed to what we obtain in the calculation and see that the accident lonely calculations qualitatively can catch most of the features in the dispersive line outs, while in the case of the crystal, uh, it doesn't match at all. So what we observe on few in the second time scale can be explained fully with an atomic like model with no dispersive states. And which is where the interaction with the IR field is dominated by optical static. And this is in line with what has been observed already in silicon dioxide or magnesium oxide. And what I show you here is the differential uh, trace, the slow component, and the associated slow component on the pump reflectivity. And you see that we they, they really relate with what has been observed already in silicon dioxide and magnesium oxide, where you see a shift of the excitonic peak due to the optical star shift. And you see also, like here in magnesium oxide, the creation of new features around zero delay due to uh, the activation of originally dark excitonic states. Well, this trace is rich in information, of course. Um, you can, for example, by knowing the shift of, of the state uh, and knowing the IR fluency, uh, you can retrieve the uh, excitonic dipole. Uh, from which, uh, with a model, you, you can actually learn about the OGA decay uh, of the coral um, that you created with the XV, which we found to be to have a lifetime about 2.3 femtoseconds in line with the lifetimes of the holes in, in silicon dioxide and magnesium oxide. Or you can learn also about the coupling of the phones uh, of, of your exit. Um, we are working in this regard, uh, we are working about the possibility to learn uh, something more or to try to improve the accuracy uh, on these figures. Um, because when, whenever you have an IR fluence, which is um, on the same time scale of or the dynamics you want to extract, it's not so easy to be precise, to be honest. Uh, you, you start to be close to the cross correlation of, of your pump probes, of the, the resolution of your pump probe. And then you need to have um, information regarding something that 
uh, that, that describes the sample. For example, you need to know uh, the, the coupling with the photons, with the phonons from other measurements and so forth to be able to extract um, reliable uh, values for these quantities, these physical quantities. So we, we started to, to wonder, is it possible to try to use a different approach, maybe a reconstruction approach, uh, like in, in at the second transient, uh, at second spectroscopy and uh, photoelectron spectroscopy, so in, in an at second striking experiment. Um, well, the, the relation that gives you the reflectivity doesn't really look like the one that gives you in, in uh, strong field approximation the photoelectron trace that you get with the streaking. But if you look into the dielectric function, these resembles that a bit. You, you can see the exciton dipole um, as an object, and then you can have a probe or a gate, uh, which is a phase gate related to the Stark effect going to E square. Um, it's not really a pure phase gate in this case, because you have a, a complex polarizability in front. Uh, but nevertheless, it is possible with a combination of pi and e pi, and I want to go too much into the details with this. If you are interested, uh, there is a paper which describes it very nicely. But it is possible to, what is nice is that it's possible to modify the uh, reconstruction algorithm that originally were written to retrieve the temporal characteristics of your SUV and IR pulse to reconstruct the excitonic dipole and the IR uh, temporal evolution. Now, this has been proven on, on simulations uh, with only one exciton transition as a proof of principle. And we are working on the extension to be able to apply it to experimental data where you also have more than one transition and dark exitons involved. Coming back to our experimental results, what is really new, uh, I told you, is the appearance of a very fast signal, which seems to be catched by the full model. And in this case, we can play the same trick we did before. So we can divide in exciton contribution and crystal contribution. And what we see uh, is oscillations in both of them with twice the AR frequency. In the exciton case, they come from the optical suck effect. In the crystal case, they come from the dynamical fence scavenge effect, as has been observed in diamond, for example, in absorption. The B shape is uh, reversed because of the different definition of the data. And now uh, it seems once again that the optical Stark effect and the atomic nature of the accident is enough to reproduce qualitatively. So is this the case? Well, what we can do is zoom in. And since now we have a nice calibration, independent calibration of our pump probe delay, we can extract the phase delay of these oscillations as a function of energy, following, for example, the maximum uh, of, this, of the oscillation and compare it one-to-one uh, -one without the need of any external parameter. And if we do that, we see that the experiment here in black well matches with the um, full calculations results, while um, the crystal does not, and also the exciton response does not. The crystal, the B shape of the crystal is what has been observed in dynamical fence scavenge effect, and in, in, uh, for, for example, again, in, in diamond, and resembles in shape what this, the full system does, but, but clearly uh, doesn't match. Uh, while the atomic res atomic like response, so the, the red one here, doesn't match even qualitatively. And this to us is a proof that if you want to understand what is going on on the second time scale with strong fields on the exciton here, you have to take into account for the coupling with the crystal. So you have to include in your, in your model a dispersive state. Uh, and this means that you cannot neglect the solid nature of the exciton. As I said, the response of the bare crystal and the response of the full system, they are strongly related. Uh, they are not the same, of course. Uh, if you do the difference between them, you see uh, that the difference is quite big. Uh, can be as big as 750 up to second in total. So for sure not negligible. Um, and you see, for example, that the exciton response is advanced compared to the crystal, while the um, conduction band response is delayed compared to the bare crystal situation uh, of many hundreds of attoseconds. 
Um, but the shape of the two curves here is, is similar. And this is striking indeed. You, you can shift one on top of the other with a rigid energy shift and they almost perfectly match. And this again is for us a proof that what happens, uh, the, the exciton inherits the dispersion properties of the bare crystal uh, at its formation and shows the same dispersion relation with, uh, with the pump field, but due to the crystal action interaction, the actual delay at a certain input and energy is actually different. We will see here the difference. So if this is true and it's related to the effects like the dynamical transcalvish effect, then uh, there must be a link between what we observe in the reflectivity and the actual motion of the excitonic particle. We cannot see that in the experiment, but if we go back to the calculations, we can try to look at the dipole and the excitonic dipole and extract its phase delay with the field in the case of full system or if we neglect the crystal. And we see that the phase delay between the, the dipole and the, the field uh, changes and becomes bigger um, in case of uh, exciton only. And the, the jump between the two is, uh, the offset between the two is 252 after second. Now we go to the exciton position and do an average evaluation of the phase delay there and extract the values. We see that we have the same kind of displacement in the same direction and uh, it's about 270 to 2 seconds. So nicely agrees to what we observe in the dipole oscillations. And this means there is a strong link between the sub nanometric motion of the exciton in the field and what we observe in the transit activity on at the second time scale. So to conclude, just two remarks. Um, you, you see, we, we saw um, that what we observe is related to the bare crystal response. And what, then one may argue, okay, what is the role of, and it's related to the, the capability of the accident to, to be accelerated by the field. So one may argue, which is the role of the accident uh, binding energy or initial localization. Um, what we decided to do is to perform different calculations with different binding energy and see what we get. And what we got was the following. So by exploring the binding energy from 0 0.7 to 4.2 EV, which is rather big experimentally, probably one can try to change the binding energy in certain systems only up to hundreds of milli electron volt with stress or, or doping. But just for the purpose of understanding what is going on here, we, we change a lot the binding energy and we saw that we always have a D-shaped dispersion, so always a solid-like dispersion behavior. Of course, the difference with the bare crystal increases with increasing binding energy and becomes rather huge uh, for big binding energies, but it's always possible to shift the curves one on top of each other. But with, a, with an energy shift that doesn't really follow the binding energy uh, rigidly of the exciton, and this means that the apex of the V-shape uh, the, the relative position of the apex of the V-shape changes with respect to the exciton transition with the binding energy, which means that it's possible to change a bit the relation between the, the timing of different positions in the crystal, for example, the conduction band and the excitonic transition by changing the binding energy. For example, one can realize a condition where one is advanced and the other is delayed, or both of them are delayed. And this means, uh, gives us another tool if you want to be a visionary uh, to, to sculpt the properties of your excitonic quasi particles. In this respect, one may say, okay, but technologically, um, core excitons are not so relevant. True, but magnesium fluoride has also a balanced exciton, uh, maybe more relevant. Not so easy to, to investigate experimentally, its binding energy is one electron volt. Um, but at least with calculation, it is possible to look into it. And what we observe is that we see the same behavior we see with core accidents, so where the atomic-like uh, model cannot describe what is happening in the full system, and you see a V-shaped dispersion typical of the bare crystal. And also in this case, the dispersion changes with the binding energy following more or less the binding energy of, of the accident. So it should be there also for less bound accidents. Of course, the, the less you are bounded, uh, the more you go close to the bare crystal response. And this should hold, uh, to be true, uh, for excitons which are 
well described by the Vanya model. So where the excitons are, we expect it to, to, to hold for excitons, um, which are built starting from dispersive bands. If you instead want to study Frankel excitons, which are constructed starting from more localized orbitals uh, molecules, for example, then the situation might be very different. And there, uh, it's probably an outlook. What we could try to do in the future is to find a system with a Frankel, definitely Frankel excitons, and, and see uh, if it has the, if it exhibits the same duality or not. So this brings me to my conclusion. I. I, I uh, think I showed you uh, one of the first, if not the first, observation of sub to second exciton dynamics done with at the second transit spectroscopy and uh, at the second transit effectivity spectroscopy. And, and this actually uh, shows the potential of this technique to investigate few to second and not to second dynamics, which in, uh, in this case allowed us to disentangle the atomic and solid nature of the exciton, showing that they manifest themselves differently and on different time scales. The uh, at the second motion is linked to the nanometric motion of the excitant in this case. And also, uh, this is a general behavior that can be found not only in core excitants, but also in balanced excitants, which are more relevant for technological applications. And then this gives us possibility to think about very exotic experiments where we we control the properties of these quasi particles in advanced materials and try to get some very exciting physics out of it. I would like to, at the very end, to, to thank everybody involved uh, in these measurements. So all the people from Politecnico in Milano, from CNR, Milano and Padova, and all the theory group, uh, particular thanks to Shoshu Kesato from Tsukuba University and all the group of Angel Rubio at the Max Planck Institute for the Structure and Dynamics of Matter. And before concluding, I still have time uh, before the talk for Cochrane, so I uh, would like to uh, advertise uh, within the Atto Second Research Center where I work here in Milano, open PhD and postdoc positions. There are two big projects, ERC project founded by the European community. One is the Audace project um, that is dealing with Atto Second measurements of electron and exit dynamics in, in materials. And the other one is a Tomato Synergy Project uh, with the PIs, Mauro and Isoli. And these, uh, the, the idea of this project is to investigate um, the second dynamics in uh, complex molecules. So if you're interested in one or the other, please go on the websites and have a look. And with this, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm ready to receive your questions. Thank you so much for your great talk. We have already quite a few questions uh, coming up. So the first two or three are from Sankita Sharma. Uh, what is the dependence of the excitons on the pump fluence? This is up to what fluence do they survive? Okay, Sankita, I can see that you're uh, allowed to talk. So if you would like to speak and ask the questions yourself, go and, and feel free to do so, please. Hi, thank you for such a good talk. I, I was really interested in your dynamics uh, part and could you please, I, I mean, Clara already said the question. Could you please tell us how does it depend on the pump fluence and how fast is it created, the ex exciton? Is okay, so for exciton creation, we didn't really, well, well, first of all, thank you very much for your question, it's very interesting. Um, uh, for for exciton creation, I know there is a lot of interest in looking into exciton creation nowadays. We didn't really look into that. Um, the model we use, for example, to extract the uh, coupling with the with the uh, OGA decay or with the phonons um, assumes instantaneous excitation. And the point is that we didn't see any deviation from the envelope of our IR pulse on the trading edge, uh, which means that most probably is so fast that we do not have with these five, six, 20 second IR pulses, um, we don't have clues to say anything about that specifically. So I, I cannot really give any reliable information on that one. We would need to have faster pulses, I think. Um, for what concern instead the fluence, I think I have a slide, 
if I manage to connect back and change. Okay. So here um, we we try experimentally. It's it's quite difficult. Um, you are limited by the fact that the the, the um, so it's a, again a, a technicality. You your your spectrometer XUV spectrometer is quite slow, um, which means that it's difficult to go shot to shot, if not impossible in our case. And compared to what people do in the visible, this means that you are limited to a sensitivity to one percent maybe a tiny bit better, but not so much better. It's difficult to go in the one per mil case. So every time you have to pump quite strongly with your IR if you want to be able to see the signal. And experimentally, we tried um, to, to keep the IR in a regime where the system response is still linear, so it's not changing too much with the IR intensity. Uh, but close enough to the limit where you start to damage the system. And in this regime, we also observe, we always observe the same features. Also, theoretically, those are calculations. Uh, you can see that the response you get uh, for 10 to the 10 watt per centimeter square of the IR field, 11, 12, or 8, 10 to the 12, is basically always the same up to let's say 10 to the 13, where you start to see deviations uh, of your response. And also, I don't know if you see it, but the orange curve here of the phase delay starts to deviate a tiny bit, while for the others, for the other cases, it's basically perfectly overlapped to the other second. So, uh, so these calculations, just a question, these calculations are based on the model or they are done like fully ab initio many body theory? No, 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 based on the model. Based on the model. Okay, okay. So because in the model, you would put in this information that it is no, response. So I, I can, I don't, I mean, this I wouldn't put weight on saying, since this says it, it's 10 to the power 12, maybe. I, I, I don't know the de details of the model, but this information probably goes in rather than comes out. Yes, you're right. I mean, this is just, um, saying the same we observed in lab, more or less, a bit more nicely. Uh, and here with the calculation, we can go back a bit, of, a little bit back and show that at least the model we, we use uh, doesn't have is not strongly affected by the AR oops, intensity. It, it would be very difficult to see it experimentally because of the experimental noise. So I, I guess at a certain point you start for sure to see. Uh, that you reach a critical density of your excitons, for example, if this is what you mean. Uh, but we didn't see that in the in the optical in the range we could explore um, experimentally. And if we increase more the intensity, even if we have a bulk sample, we start to to destroy the sample. So it's uh, we couldn't with this sample we couldn't. Maybe if we change the sample, if we reduce the repetition rate. Uh, 10 kilohertz is not really needed at this point. And we cool the sample somehow. We can then sustain higher fluxes and see and see what happens. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So we also have questions here from Gilmo Ehnot. Uh, in your experimental data, can you comment again about the pi phase shifting energy in your subfemtosecond exciton dynamics? between a exciton and conduction band edge energy? Is it a signature of the different time scale of these dynamics, exciton versus crystal? Uh, I have allowed you also to speak if you would like to. So uh, can you hear me properly? Yes. Yes, so in, in your first plot, top left, uh, clearly if I take a line out in energy, there's a sudden pi shift. Uh, uh, between what you've labeled as A, which I imagine is the A exciton and conduction band edge. I was just wondering, could you repeat again why this uh, such a shift? Ah, uh, you mean from A and the conduction band? Yes. Well, in, in our model, this comes uh, from, it depends on the binding energy of the exciton. Uh, and in this case, 
given the width of this dispersion, this V, and given the binding energy of 1.4 EV, um, then you get that the excitant position and the conduction band more or less are out of phase. Um, if you change the binding end, so I don't know if there is anything specific into that, to be honest, because as you see, if I, if I get whatever energy I can get at the fixed delay, uh, I, the, the phase changes a lot because of this dispersion and because of the slope of these two branches here in the V. So for example, if, if I change, I have the picture here, sorry, I get it. If I, if I change uh, the, the binding energy of the exciton and I compare again conduction band and exciton, that is actually the plot that I have here, um, then the conduction band is here and the exciton is marked by these vertical lines, then I, I get either less if the binding energy is less or more than, uh, than out of phase in phase delays. So I, I don't know if this has anything specific. Uh, I think it's related to the fact that uh, due to the interaction with the crystal, you get this specific V-shaped response, which unfortunately uh, is not so easy to explain on a very intuitive picture. We, we are struggling with that since 2016, to be honest, and trying to find a a uh, nice picture which is able to, to reproduce this shape and explain why you have this aperture and where the shape should appear. It seems to be related to the local mm, effective mass, so to the, to the curvature of, of the bands locally, where you probe this uh, mechanism. And uh, there is a paper from Otobe and co-workers suggesting that it might be related to floquet bands, uh, of the crystal you're, you're dressing. But a nice, naive interpretation is still missing. So I won't be able to tell you exactly why it is that specific value, but I can tell you that it changes with the binding energy. So for a different exciton, it won't be the same. So you don't, we won't have the same difference between the excitonic transition and the conduction band. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, we have two questions also from Luli. The first one is, what are the advantages of this approach comparing with the hey, hey g directly from the bulk crystals? And then uh, do you think the XUV wavefront would affect the results? And what is the requirement of the, U, the XUV flux on the target? Okay. So let's start from differences in harmonic generation. I'm not, and, and I want to put my hands in front here, uh, I'm not an expert on harmonic generation, but from what I, I so maybe it's better to, to confront directly with someone which has direct experience. But from what I uh, understood with harmonic generation, for example, if you want to do it with an 800 nanometer driving, uh, it becomes quite demanding. So you, you can generate harmonics, um, but you, you need to meet uh, important criteria before you, you damage completely your system. And this is why most of the results you can find, they are actually done with MIDAR. So you need a completely different source, sometimes more expensive, more, more complex. And um, what I would say is that the advantages of this technique, if this was the question originally, is that you don't really need to mind about um, your, the properties of, you don't have to tailor your, your pulse to a certain degree or your laser with uh, the sample you have to study. Um, and I think it's way more flexible in the sense that once you, you got uh, the right radiation you want, uh, you want and it's just a matter of changing the sample and, and you will get uh, the reflectivity out of it. If you want to generate harmonics, um, I, I don't know if uh, experimentally, might, to me it sounds more demanding, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong on this point. Interpretation point, of, from the interpretation point of view, um, also uh, in the sense that when you want to generate harmonics, you, you certainly have to all the time to have strong fields. Um, in this case, the results we have with absorption spectroscopy, repetitive spectroscopy, they always are with strong fields. 
uh, strongly out of equilibrium. But the idea on the long goal would be actually to perform uh, more standard time probe experiments, at least to me, which means that you resonantly pump and then you don't need to, to drive the system so much out of equilibrium to see a dynamics. So you don't distort so much the system. And this uh, is a regime that cannot be seen with uh, harmonic generation. So there you, you need for sure a strong field. Uh, the other question was if I can comment on the XUB front and uh, on the flux that you require on the sample. So let's start from the second. The, the flux on the sample, it, it's important. The, the more you have, the better XUV side, in the sense that most likely you, you will not damage your sample with the XUV. It would be nice to have a source of XUV photons that is able to do that. Unfortunately, we do not. Um, so then the question is, uh, is it better to go to high repetition rates or dilute these photons in time or have every, every, everything in one pulse? I would say um, rather the second uh, compared to photo emission spectroscopy, where if you, especially from solids, where you create a lot of electrons, you have um, space charge, and this is destroying your signal. In this case, the the more pulses you have, since you are for the moment uh, limited to strong AR fields, the more energy you will deposit on your sample because of the pump. And then uh, these will actually create a lot of heat. And even if you work in repetitivity and you can have bug samples, you will ultimately damage your sample. Um, so for example, I don't, I don't think we work with 10 kilohertz, but I don't think there is a huge improvement in using 10 kilohertz versus one kilohertz with the same number of photons that uh, photon flux, let's say. And the last, uh, yeah, yes, the XUV front is important, especially if you want to uh, to get to at the second level uh, in, in your in your measurements. Um, and, and in this case, even more important, if you want to um, have a nice calibration between the first and the second photos. And um, what we did was to try to optimize this by uh, perfect alignment of the optics and checking with uh, a crystal, a cerium crystal, that the focus we got of the XUV was close to what I expected uh, from theoretical calculations. OK, um, thank you, Matteo. It's a very wonderful work and beautiful beam line. And thanks for answering the question uh, so patiently. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, that you said the XUV flux requirement, maybe it's better to go for the ultra high repetition rate, right? Yeah. Oh, so like uh, the megahertz, maybe it would be better to uh, uh, conduct this experiment. And Mega uh, would be better for these experiments. Uh huh. Okay. But not really. I don't think so. So. If, you, if we come to the point where we have a nice source uh, where we can tune the pump and be resonant, mm. maybe yes, because then you speed up your measurement. You don't have to deposit a lot of energy on your sample. And with megahertz, you are able to, to be faster. Um, but at the moment, if you want to look into strong field physics and go out of equilibrium as in this experiment, yeah. Then you imagine you, you come with uh, 20 microjoule per pulse and you don't deposit one every millisecond, but you deposit 100 or 1,000. Uh, then you will deposit a lot of energy in your sample. And it's true that you, you will be faster because you, should, you will collect more photons, but uh, it comes to the point that you, you are faster in destroying your sample than, than in measuring. So I, I don't think for this measurement. Actually, in, in reflectivity, we could measure with 10 kilohertz. Um, but I, from the experience I have with one kilohertz system in absorption, I can tell you already that uh, it won't be possible to do the same experiment with 10 kilohertz in absorption. Hmm. 
Um, when we were working in absorption with one kilowatt and similar pulse energies to study strong field physics and, and semiconductors on insulators, uh, we were forced to reduce the fre repetition frequency to check uh, that there were no thermal effects for residual signal coming from the previous pulse. And already we were able to see something uh, when we increase the intensity of the pulses. So it, if you go to 10 kilohertz, in that case, you, you are not able to perform the experiment or you get a lot of signal coming from the previous pulse. And then mm -hmm. if this is building up, it can actually affect your results and create artifacts. And this is something you want to avoid. Yeah, the noise, right. Um, okay, and regarding the uh, wavefront, um, you said that wavefront is very important for the source itself, uh, especially for the focusing quality Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's just a new way and just use the, if one can track the wavefront or measure the wavefront online, uh, is that possible to use it as a diagnostics? To measure the wavefront? Yeah, to measure the wavefront, to, to extract some information uh, from the target, like the, um, the excitation of uh, the... Uh, oh, you extract. mean after, after, after reflection? Yeah, after reflection. Yeah, most probably, yes. Especially, I think if you if you have material which are structured, um, or it, yes, um, probably becomes at that point becomes very demanding in the sense that, from my experience, the more you have to extract information from from the photons you get, uh, the more photons you need. And uh, if you need to have their uh, wavefront analyzer in the XUV. I have to admit, I do not know how it works. I, I guess you, uh, you most probably uh, need more flux than what you need just to, to integrate your photon spectrum and that's it. Um, so probably, uh, it is as it is interesting, for example, to measure how the polarization is changing after the reflection, if you have a magnetic material then you need to be to put the polarizer there. And for example, there you have to, there I know uh, how you have to do it. You, you have to, the easiest way is to have reflection of different mirrors and rotate the mirrors, which means that you lose flux because of the reflections, and which means that at each delay, you have to scan an additional angle, uh, and which means that you need to acquire way more data. And, and this becomes way more demanding. So yes, I guess all the techniques that are used in the visible uh, are, can be extended to the XUV to a certain degree uh, and probably with more effort, but uh, for sure it's an, an interesting uh, question and something to, to look into. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we thank again, Professor Lucchini for this really great talk. And it's time to say goodbye to everyone watching on YouTube. So goodbye people on YouTube. Thank you for joining. Thank you for supporting the Other Fridays and see you in two weeks. Thank you.